Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on the program is Bible teacher Mike Beaumont. Mike Beaumont, welcome to Facing the Canon. Great to be with you today. Absolutely. I've listened to you <laughs> so many times uh, on the radio, UCB radio, and I thought I've got to talk to that man. So I'm delighted that we've got you uh, on the program. And l let me just tell you, we're going to have Mike Beaumont on for four programs. Part one, part two, part three, part four, because we're going to talk about the Bible and we're going to dig into the Bible and try and understand it. So you're a Bible teacher, Mike. How long have you been a Bible teacher? Oh, my goodness. As someone reminded me the other day, longer than they had been alive. Um, I became a Christian when I was 18 years old in the time between leaving school and going to university and really started teaching Bible pretty much from those early days because I was mentored by someone who loved the Bible. And then I finished my degree and I was a school teacher for a couple of years and then went and did my theology degree uh, and then became a pastor. And it's really since that time that, you know, the Bible teaching has really kicked in. As a pastor, you have to do all sorts of things. But I think over the years, I became increasingly, if you like, a bit more of a a specialist Bible teacher. And that's the thing that fires me up and, and gets me alive. Absolutely. Trying to take the Bible and help people understand it and to encounter the God that it reveals, of course. Absolutely. OK, so let's start then, Mike, uh, with the Bible. I've actually prepared lots of questions. Oh, wow. And but let's start with the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is known by different words. The Bible scriptures, the word of God. And I suppose that last one gives us a, a clue into what it is. The Bible is the record of God's revelation to people through history. So at one level, it's a history book. It, it, it unfolds through the ages, his encounters with people. Um, and yet it's showing us not just history, it's showing us his heart and his purposes so it's a written record of who God is, what God is like, what God is doing, what God has done through history, what God is still doing today and where God wants to take this whole thing. But how do we know it's the word of God? Well, at the end of the day, there's an element of faith comes in. Um, it's not like a scientific experiment where I can set something up and show you at the end this is. So there's a number of things. I would say, first of all, um, it's as we read it that its authenticity comes alive to us. Uh, lots of people have criticised the Bible, people who've never really read it. And when we read it, I think we start to see ourselves in it. We, we see in its stories, that's me, that's, that's how people behave. So there's a, a ring of truth, J.B. Phillips, a, a Bible scholar of many years ago, uh, called it. Uh, there's a ring of truth about life, about people, about me, that is bigger than what any individual could have come up with. It's not just the sum of human cleverness. There's stuff in it that no human being could have created or known. So I would say it's as you read it, as you start to read it, it starts to get that ring of truth and, and echoes within you. At another level, how can we trust it? Well, archaeologists are often digging up yet more facts that show us, hey, this story in the Bible was true after all. Life was like that in those days. So that again brings home to us, this is not just a story that's been written or fancified a bit like a fairy tale. It came out of real history with real people. And it has that real ring of truth to it. And, and the best way for people to discover that for themselves is, is to get into reading it. Read one of the Gospels, read one of the stories of Jesus, for example, and you'll start to see for yourself that ring of truth that it has. 
Okay, Mike, who, who put the Bible together? <laughs> well, since it's God's word, the quick answer to that would be God. But of course, God used human methods. And actually, here's one of the big differences between Christianity and, and Islam. For Muslims, their Quran exists in heaven and the angel Gabriel dictated it to Muhammad word for word and he wrote it down. The Bible has a, a more complex way of coming together than that. So it is God's word, but spoken through people. Now, sometimes people say, well, hang on, this is a bit circular, isn't it? So the Bible gives birth to the church. The church then says, this is God's word. And you go round and round in circles. Well, how did it come together? I suppose it came together in a couple of ways. If we think of the Old Testament, why was it accepted? Well, for Jews, the Bible falls into three parts, law, prophets, and writings. Law given to Moses. So its authority came from the fact that God had given it to Moses. Prophets were those who expounded that law and applied it into life and challenged it. And so it got its authority also from the fact God had given it to Moses. Writings, applications, wise applications for life. When it comes to the New Testament, I've heard people say sometimes, well, you know, the Bible really didn't come together until, what, the fourth century when the early church councils agreed, this is the Bible. But you know what? That's just not true. Functionally, people were starting to see the New Testament in those early days of the church. So when the church councils come along in later centuries, fourth century, really all they are doing is affirming at last what has been pretty clear from those earliest days. So is, is this the word of God or does it contain the word of God? Yeah, that's a really good question. The trouble is with saying it contains the word of God. That leaves me slightly uncomfortable because if it contains the word of God, suddenly now I am in a position where I can start to say, mm, I don't like that bit. Yeah. So I think I'll cut that bit out. I, know, I will say that, oh, well, that was for that time, for that generation, for that age. And it opens up this possibility of, of uh, you know, it's a bit like the pick and mix store, you know, the local sweet store, whether you have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, well, have one of those, but I really don't like licorice, so I'm not having those, thank you. So for me, I don't like the language at all of the Bible contains the word of God. I believe the Bible is the word of God rather than it contains it. It's interesting, you know, in, um, in Galatians, Paul is having this debate with his friends in the churches in Galatia and uh, the Judaizers had been in behind him trying to get the early Christians to adopt the traditions of, of Judaism as well. And Paul stood strongly against that. And to do that, he takes them right back to Abraham and says, come on, let's go right back to the beginning and remember how it was. It was always by faith with Abraham, wasn't it? And in chapter three, he talks about how God made a promise to Abraham and his seed. And he goes on to say, now it says there, and his seed, not and his seeds, meaning to many people, but and to his seed, singular, meaning one person who is the Christ. In other words, for Paul, each word was significant. Each word came from God. Did it matter that it said seed rather than seeds? You bet it did, Paul said. This book really is God's word, doesn't just contain it. How do we read the Bible, Mike? It's, um, it's a library. There are 66 books in yeah. here. Okay, how do we read it? What's the best way of reading it? Yeah, well, the best way is not to start at the beginning. And I would certainly say that for a new Christian. Please, please don't start at the beginning because it won't be long before you hit some pretty challenging books like Leviticus and things like that. So for, if you're a new Christian, first of all, start, start with the stories of Jesus. 
Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and read the stories of Jesus and get to know him. Maybe then go on to the book of Acts and see what the early church did with that message of Jesus. Get some help from one of your leaders in the church. And these days there are so many aids out there to be able to help people to get into a regular rhythm of reading. So choosing the right bit to read at the right time is important. Systematic reading. I'm a great believer in steadily plodding through the Bible. That doesn't mean Genesis to Revelation. You may be moving from one book to another or following a reading program. But, you know, sticking at it day by day, I have lost count of the number of times in my own life when I've been in a situation and thought, dear God, I am in such need today. I need your help. And I've turned to my Bible reading for that day. And guess what? There's the word that I've needed. And I've not been flipping through thinking, oh, quick, I, can I find a word here that will help me? And the other way to read is, remember, this is God's word. This was inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, working on people so that what they wrote was exactly what he wanted written. So pray. Uh, it might sound a really obvious thing to say, but before you read the Bible, pray and say, Lord, I believe this book is your word. I believe you want to speak to me today. Please now, Holy Spirit, you caused this book to be written. Could you now please help me to understand? So reading the right part, get some help with that. Regular reading, really important. Praying, asking the Holy Spirit to help you. And then when you've read it, don't just fold it up and put it away. Stop and think, okay, what has God said to me? And I think it's amazing how many people don't do that at times. Just read it, then maybe read their daily notes, fold it up, put it away, get on with the day. Stop, think about what it. What one thing are you saying to me yeah, today? It's like ruminating, yeah. meditating, chewing on it, chewing on it, yeah. and thinking, what is it? That, what's the one thing? What's the one thing you want me to get from this today, Lord? And go out and start living, because this is not a dead book. It's a living book. It's meant to change lives and change people. So if you're just reading this and it's just filling up here, I now know another Bible verse. Hey, it's not done its job. It's meant to get from here to here, to here. So Lord, what one thing are you saying to me today that you want me to go and put into practice out of what I've read in your word today? Absolutely. And um, I'm always, when I read the Bible, uh, Mike, I always feel, look, I'm reading it along with the author. Yes. <laughs> That's quite a thought, isn't it? It is. And I can say, Lord, yeah. you put this together. Yeah. Then as I read it, can I read it along with you? Now, you said you like reading it systematically. Mm. Do you follow a particular plan? I've, I've used many different plans over the years. I mean, first of all, there are so many plans out there today. Uh, Either things like Daily Bread or UCB's Work for Today. Goodness, you know, I hardly dare name any because there are so many that you can get. Many of them free these days as well. Many online. If you do get stuff online, please, I would say to people, check out, you know, with one of your church leaders that the site you've gone to is a good one. And it's not someone who's going to mislead you. So I've used things like that. I've worked uh, steadily through I often just pray and say, okay, Lord, what, which book do you want me to read next? Um, and then perhaps think, well, I've not read that for a while. I'm going to read that one. But I do then try and work systematically through that book. So I would say variety is quite important. You know, it ought not to be so, but the reality is, I, you know, I've found many people over the years saying, yeah, I start reading the Bible and I find it boring. Well, I think if it's boring, it's not because of the book, it's because of the reader. <laughs> yes. You know, you, you're reading it wrong. You've got stuck in a rut. Maybe you did, with good heart, intend to read through the whole Bible in one year. Well, that takes about six or seven chapters a day to do. You know, and for many people, that's hard going, and they, they get to Leviticus and all the sacrifices, and by the time they get to chapter seven of Leviticus, they've given in and, you know, gone back to Luke's gospel or something. So systematic is good, but I would say find what works for you. And if you're struggling, go and ask one of your pastors, your vicar, 
Christian leader, a Christian friend, go into your local Christian bookshop and say, what have you got that can help me? Many Bibles these days have reading plans at the back that you can follow as well. So variety definitely helps, but being systematic also helps. Also helps, absolutely. Uh, years ago, um, I used to try and focus on one book of the Bible a year. And I read it, read it, reread it, reread it, I digest yeah. it, and really know that particular uh, book of the Bible. And uh, I found also helpful Robert Murray McShane's Bible reading plan. And uh, if you follow this plan, you'll read through the Old Testament once, the Book of Psalms twice, the New Testament twice in one year. But you don't necessarily have to do it in one year exactly you yeah. know and in fact in um recent this year Killy and i have been focusing on the new testament reading plan here and um something like this i mean you can get this off the internet or, or we produce a little booklet to make it easier for people to access but as you say uh mike there are lots of different resources out there absolutely but find one um, that will create commitment yes. and discipline because I think the danger, and would you agree, Mike, if we don't have some plan, we can just wander. Absolutely. And the trouble is with wandering, it's, it's just easy to stop. You know, there's, at, at least if you're reading from a little booklet or, you know, you can tick off each day that you've done and you know, will the heaven fall down on your head if you do not read your Bible seven days out of seven? No, as I can testify. But is it good if you can read your Bible regularly as many days as possible each week? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the only other alternative is, is what I call the promise box approach. My, my old grandma, who is now with the Lord, uh, was a member of the Salvation Army and used to have the bonnet and Grandad was in the band and played the trombone. And one of my earliest memories of her was that when we used to visit on a Sunday afternoon after tea, she would get her promise box out, which for those who don't know is a little box with uh, little scrolls inside, verses of scripture, and you had a little pair of tongs and tweezers and you got out your promise for the day and read it. And they were all great promises, but they were all random, all out of context. And some Christians can come to the Bible a bit like that. You know, you flip open your Bible and think, oh, what shall I read today? Do you know what? I'm doing that way. You, you, you might get a good one, but, you know, you might, get, uh, you might get something you don't want. Like, you know, Lord, I need a word from you today. Open your Bible. Judas went out and hung himself. Yes. Yeah. OK, no, don't want that one. Try again. What's my next word? Go and do that likewise. No, yeah. I don't want that one don't either. That one. Try again what you are about to do, do quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Old story, isn't it? But yes, still gets its, its point true. across. Yeah. Systematic reading is a way that enables God to speak. In fact, can I give you a couple of uh, quick examples? I'll give you a couple of examples where I have had God really speak to me powerfully out of systematically uh, reading I was sharing with you earlier how previous couple of years our own family's been through, you know, some quite some challenges with my youngest daughter having breast cancer twice, my wife having breast cancer, my young grandson being rushed into hospital with appendicitis, uh, and my daughter being in America, by the way, and that being quite hard to be supportive during all the COVID lockdown. And I called out to God early in that and said, God, I need a word to stand on. And at that time, I happened to be reading through two kings. And I got to two kings, chapter 19, that day I called out to God. And it's where King Hezekiah finds the city of Jerusalem, surrounded uh, by the Assyrian king, by Sennacherib, threatening him and saying, unless you yield to me, I'm going to destroy this city. And Hezekiah spreads the threatening letter out before the Lord and says, Lord, do you see this? I'm in need. And God sends Isaiah the prophet to prophesy, and he prophesies over Sennacherib. And as I was reading through that passage, suddenly one verse leapt out to me where Isaiah prophesies to the Assyrian king, I will put a ring in your nose and a bit in your mouth, and I will lead you back by the way that you came. Now in context, 
That was a word of what God was going to do over that Assyrian king. Treat him like a, he thought he was powerful. He was just a mere oxen that God would put a ring in its nose and lead him away. And he did the very next morning. But out of that, that scripture leapt alive to me. And I felt God say, this is what I will do to your daughter's cancer. I will put a ring in its nose and a bit in its mouth and I'll take it back the way that it came. And I took that scripture and I prayed it day after day after day, sometimes several times a day. But it came not because I was hunting. What's a great verse that I could pray at this time? There it was, popping up. Yes, I'd need it to apply into my situation, hey, which is what the Bible helps us to do. But I wouldn't have had that had I not been steadily plodding through two kings. And just that word being in just the right place on just the right day to give me the prayer ammunition that I needed based on God's promise to see my daughter coming through. And I was just about to ask you this question. Reading the text in its context, and so many of us might, you know, we might take a promise uh, that, you know, do not be discouraged, do not be dismayed, I'm your God, I will lead you. But many of those promises were to Israel. Yeah. So you applied that particular scripture to your situation. So are we able to take the promises in the Bible and apply them to ourselves? Um, I would say yes and no <laughs> to that. Yes, because this is a living word and it is for today. But I would say we have to be careful. And I would say what happened to me just there is, if you like, the exception rather than the norm. I think we have to be very careful of just taking any random verse that we choose and applying it to us. Um, so there are many promises that were given to Israel in the Old Testament that were to do with their being established in the land and becoming prosperous and wealthy, for example, why? Because God wanted to establish a people who could show to the world what it was like when you let God reign in your midst. Can I take every one of those verses and apply it to me today? No, I can't because I have to read the Old Testament with my New Testament glasses on. Christ has come there yes. and fulfilled everything and changed everything. And blessing now is not necessarily material blessing. In fact, the New Testament makes it clear we are just as likely to be persecuted for following Jesus as become wealthy and rich. So God does at times, uh, we often talk about quickening a verse, it coming alive. It, it's like it, it comes on fire in the page and you think God's spoken to me to, through that. But I think it's always important to try and put it back in its context as well. Because if we're not careful, you know, we could end up taking a scripture out of context. And that's how heresies start. That's how cults start. People see one verse and think, oh, yeah, I'll do that. And before you know it, it's led them away from Jesus. So be careful is what I would say. God does use verses out of context at times. I, I've experienced that myself. One was when I was a very young Christian. You know, I said I'd become a Christian at the age of 18. And one of the big problems I had when I became a Christian, even at that age, was I used to drink far too much and I used to get drunk on Saturday nights. That was my lifestyle before I came to Christ. And even when I'd come to Christ, alcohol still stayed a problem for some time until God spoke to me one day out of a scripture, completely out of context. For some reason, I happened to find myself in Leviticus 10. I really don't recommend you know, a new Christian starting there. I think I must have been following a Bible reading plan. And I came across this verse in Leviticus 10 that day that said, do not drink strong wine or drink, uh, do not drink wine or strong drink when you enter the tabernacle of God, lest you die. And I thought, oh my goodness. And honestly, God spoke to me out of it yes. and said, Mike, you need to stop drinking. It's completely out of context. It's in the context of two of the sons of Aaron offering unlawful sacrifice to God and being struck down for it and then God saying, listen, let's get the priesthood yes. in order. Here's some rules for how you've got to do it. You know, one of them is I don't want you going in the temple drunk. So there was a context to it that I now understand. But actually God used it out of context many, many years ago 
because the principle is timeless. Absolutely. And that's probably the point of so many of yeah. these. The principles yeah. are timeless and yes. God's spirit can take it Absolutely. And, and convict us. Yeah. And, and that's us. certainly so, isn't it, when we're in the Old Testament where many of the promises made are part of God's covenant to Israel, but they're not part of God's covenant with me as a Christian. But there are principles there that, that I can take. When God tells his people, hey, when you're harvesting, don't harvest to the edge of your field. Leave the edge of your fields for the poor. Well, when I last check it, I didn't have a field and I don't harvest. But I tell you what, there's a powerful principle there. Do not bleed everything dry. Mark. Absolutely. Leave something for the poor. Think about them. Be concerned for them. And that principle applies in any and every generation. Uh, you've worked on this um, Christian's uh, Christian basic Bible. Uh, that must have been fun. Tell it, just tell us about this. Yeah, it, it was a, 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 frankly a wonderful opportunity to be invited by uh, Tyndale Publishers in the USA to, to be involved in this along with my co-writer Martin Manser. And uh, we'd actually been working on some material for a, uh, for a Bible for Myanmar, actually, where I have interest because I've uh, been there and taught over years. And Martin is married to someone who is Burmese. And so we'd both got this heart and had done this. And out of that, the material we'd done, we thought, you know, I wonder if we could develop this. And we started to play around with ideas and came up with the idea of a Bible that was written especially for new Christians. And we approached uh, Tyndale Publishers about it. They loved the idea. We got some samples for them. And so Martin and I worked on this uh, together. And it's an edition of the Bible based on New Living Translation, very easy to read. And then Martin and I produced introductions for each Bible book's notes in little panels uh, all the way through, some on character, some on belief, some on behavior, some on social and historical things at the time, but all of them written in simple language for a new Christian, someone who has no idea what the word justification means yet. So it's written very simply, loads of notes at the back for people to be able to find, where do I find something about this in the Bible? Um, so yeah, so it, it's an addition either for brand new Christians or the other thing is for people who've got maybe a bit stuck in the Bible, who need a bit of a fresh approach to it. Uh, it. It's an addition I could recommend for them as well. And it was a great privilege to be involved in producing that. Well, and I recommend it. Christian Basics Bible. Thank you, Mike. It's been a joy just to talk with you about the Bible. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. It's been great to be with you. And like you, I can talk about the Bible anytime. Absolutely. Wow, didn't that go quickly? And that's why we're doing a four-part series with Mike Beaumont. I hope that's inspired you. Please join us again next week for part two. Thank you.